Everybody needs to set goals. Everybody needs to give and receive feedback. Everybody needs to assess what's working well and what's not. They should hire people that are goal oriented and motivated. You have to have all those critical disciplines happening. This is what is going to take you to a growth trajectory. excited today because I always love talking to goal center people and today we've got someone who literally helps other people do that and so I'm excited to jump on in. Jeff, tell us who you are and what do you do with your business? Todd, great to see you today. Uh, I am Jeff Hunt, so I'm CEO of Goalspan and Goalspan is a performance management technology company. Okay. I also do a few other things. I'm the host of, of uh, the Human Capital Podcast. Awesome. I chair a CEO group that meets in person once a month in the San Francisco Bay Area. Awesome. And I'm a consultant to C-suite execs. I love it. Is this a Vistage group or what kind of uh, executive group is this? You know, it's similar to Vistage. We have seven CEOs that range from 25 employees to 3,200 uh, from basically 25 million to 420 million in revenue. We do half day meetings. It's a mastermind group. Love it. Uh, fantastic group of people ah, and women. I, I'm inspired by that. I was just at one yesterday and, uh, and I'm inspired by the whole concept, the whole beauty of how that works together. We'll get into that later. Yes. But tell me about, tell me about who you serve with your business. I, I'm dying to know, you know, you're a goal company. T tell us what that means. What does that actually mean? We serve small to medium sized companies. So we, our smallest client has less than 10 employees. Our largest has more than 1500. Love it. Uh, we serve multinational companies that have divisions in different countries. Uh, what's really interesting, Todd, about our sector is that everybody needs to set goals. Right. Everybody needs to give and receive feedback. Everybody needs to assess what's working well and what's not and hopefully right. develop their employees. Right. And so we're kind of ubiquitous in that regard. We apply to any type or size organization. So wait a second. So you're telling me that um, business owners shouldn't expect their employees just to be driven and goal oriented and, and able to achieve stuff without their help? Well, they should expect that, but they sh like they should hire people that are goal oriented and motivated, right. but they also need to provide a lot of tools in order to help them understand what's important so that they can achieve it. I love it. So how does your tool do this? Tell us what it actually does. So it takes the broken, dysfunctional performance, traditional performance review, which is this once a year conversation right, where we have right. all these surprises and anxiety. Yes. <laughs> and it migrates that into an ongoing continuous performance management conversation. So Love that it. includes uh, setting goals, near-term goals. We recommend quarterly, okay. but our clients do it in all different ways. It includes awesome. uh, giving and receiving feedback that's not just feedback about how you're doing with achieving your goals, but also how are you doing upholding our core values? Uh, what it. are some of the development areas that you really need to work on? What are some, right. some skill growth and competency development? Right, uh, right, right. And how can we work better together as a team? So, so yeah, it's really the goal setting, it's the, the feedback and then the assessment. So how are we doing collectively on achieving all these things together? You know, the thing I love about your business and the, lo the thing I love about your model is that, in my opinion, any company that's listening to this podcast trying to find tips and tricks to, to grow and scale, you truly can't without everything you just talked about. You can't do it without a clear mission. You can't do it without core values. You can't do it without like specific thresholds and benchmarks you're trying to hit. So in my opinion... There's not a single person listening to this podcast who shouldn't be looking at a software tool like yours. That's just my opinion. But yep. yeah, mm -hmm. what do you think of that opinion? I totally agree with you. <laughs> and I'm going to put an and on the end of that okay. statement that the implementing software is not the panacea. In other words, right. like right. some organizations think if I just do this, then it's going to solve all my problems. But you have right. to have all those critical disciplines 
happening. Like you have, you just mentioned Todd vision, mission values, right? Big, big believer in that. Yes. If I haven't cast a vision, so people really know where we're going and it's a compelling, inspiring vision. And we rally people around that. I haven't right. created core values. So we have a common language of what behaviors right. really are what we're expecting. Then it's going to be a lot harder to get people on board around. Re- really, really what you do is you are aligning teams to function as a team to accomplish common goals. No question. Perfect. We try to align your workforce around what's most important. I love it. This is huge. And and for those listening, if you don't have these things clearly identified, don't worry, you're not alone. I would say the vast majority of companies out there, especially those of you finishing, kind of wrapping up your launch phase and trying to get into a growth motion, you're not alone. Most people have driven themselves past launch with a simple goal of launching something. Now that you're where you're at, you got to dial into this because this is powerful and this is what is going to take you to a growth trajectory. So, so with your software, who, who's your perfect client? You mentioned companies as small as 10, you mentioned companies with 1500 that are multinational. Who do you find this works the best for? What stage of growth are they typically in? Our sweet spot is really 50 to 250 or 500 employees. And we find that in that space, they are definitely in need of greater process. They need to sort of systematize things. And so our software does a great job at that. I love it. I love it. We have have a minimum fee of 234 bucks a month, but we have clients with three people paying that (laughs) because they feel they need that process discipline. Love it. And yet we also have much larger companies doing it. But I would say the sweet spot where you can really affect change is in that 50 to 250. And that's also the place, Todd, where if you don't implement something like this, you can be in real trouble because you have a harder time managing outcomes and results in the long run. I love this. I I absolutely love your business. I love what you do. Now that we know who you are, who you serve and what you do, tell us about your journey. I mean, you've been on this journey now since 2007. What have you done to get where you're at today? I mean, you're in 12 countries. You're, you've got tons of active users. What, what's kind of the, what does this look like so far for you? What are some highlights? Sure. I think that when I reflect on my journey, it never goes as you expect. So that's no. actually one piece of <laughs> advice I would share with anybody trying to scale a business. Right. It's kind of like the your home improvement project, at least for most people, it costs twice as much as you expect. It takes about two or three long, times longer than you expect. And then you're right on target. Always. But I've, I've made the decision not to, up to this point, accept any outside capital. And I've done that intentionally. So um, that's allowed me to really maintain the quality of our customer service experience and drive the business and the software development in an area that I believe makes the most sense rather than somebody who's running a venture capital uh, fund. Right. (laughs) Just a few seconds to let you know about a project that we've been putting together for the last several months, and we're finally launching it called the Captain's Council. You see, as a CEO or operator of a business, it can feel like you get stuck in your own head a lot of the time. You get challenges that you don't know how to resolve. You get people causing problems in your leadership team that you don't know how to resolve. And it's so hard to overcome those things by yourself. You don't have to anymore. Join the Captain's Council. Captain's Council is a group of other CEOs and operators and owners of businesses where we come together once a month for several hours to discuss the biggest challenges you're facing. You express to the council of eight to 10 people about what's going on. Where do you feel stuck? And these other people are in the same boat as you. They're running and operating their own businesses. They're your peers. They help you kind of dissect what's happening and help you see things that you may not have seen all by yourself. If you don't have a good, strong network of people around you, come join the Captain's Council. This is gonna be something that will change the way you run your business and open your eyes to opportunities that you have never seen 
without the help of your peer group. Come check it out, captainscouncil.com. No, this is, this is, you are definitely the anomaly. I would say that anyone in the Bay Area producing a tech company is it, unheard of not to go out and raise a crap ton of money and just go crazy with it, right? What has driven you to that decision to stay bootstrapped and to stay um, so controlled as opposed to just raising money? Sure. You know, I've had the fortune of being involved in a lot of different types of businesses. So yeah. previous in, in my previous career, I ran a company that was a family owned business and we sold it to a Fortune 150. I ran it under public ownership. I've had a lot of merger and acquisition experience. So I got to acquire cool. companies and merge them. I've also done a lot of uh, consulting work with com companies that have have right. bought and sold and also dealt with capitalization issues. And so I've had the exposure of both sides of the equation. And I've had right. the fortune to be able to invest in my business in the way that I think it's going to benefit both our employees and our customers first. I love it. Um, yeah. So well, that's I mean, kind of my... The, the thing that I love about it, I'm, I'm, I've bootstrapped the vast majority of everything I've ever done. And and. So sometimes I look at myself thinking I'm an idiot for doing that. And other times, you know, when I, when I do uh, lectures to younger audiences, they, their minds immediately go to how do I raise my first seed money? How do I raise my series? A? how do I raise this and raise that? And I think, and I ask them, when do you start generating revenue? Like, what does your product look like? Who's your avatar? What, what is exactly. this? You know, and, and I think that th I love hearing your story because I want people out there that have raised money not to feel guilty about it, but you really do need to look at this from the perspective that you've taken this business in bootstrapping is okay. Like you can actually survive on the revenue being generated from your clients if you want to, <laughs> you know, exactly. T tell me what advantage you think that's given you in the growth of this business. The beauty of bootstrapping is it truly forces you to become excellent at prioritizing resources. Yes, it does. You know, if you have a massive cash infusion, you're a little less worried about where you're going to spend money. I mean, obviously, you're going to spend a lot of money. Right. But when you're bootstrapping an organization with your own money, you're very intentional about those investments. And oftentimes that prioritization is better yeah. Than what you would see in a company that's accepted outside capital. Agreed. Agreed. Now, now I love this. I love this conversation. I honestly, I had no idea coming into this that you were that type of business founder because I just assume when I see San Francisco area on someone's profile that they've raised money. Right. So, right. so tell me, you know, the biggest challenge of that though. I mean, you obviously can't grow as fast as you would like to maybe, but has that been your biggest challenge or where do you find your biggest hiccup so far in the, in your journey? Um, I would say that part of it is around the abundance mindset, you know, getting my head around the abundance mindset, I like not that. the scarcity mindset, but yeah. the abundance mindset. And what do you mean so, by that? Explain that a little bit. Right. So you, the example is the longer you're in, any segment of the software business, the more crowded it gets. If you look yes. at our space over the last 10 years, we've had just an enormous increase of the number of competitors. Yeah. The abundance mindset says that's okay. They're going to actually make me better. Yeah. The scarcity mindset says, oh, they're going to take my business away. What do I do? I'm going to exactly. make decisions out of fear and I don't want to do that. So right. yeah, over time as I've had a few more clicks on the odometer. I've kind of come to a, a better place around the abundance mindset. And I'm Love less it. worried about, you know, scare, not having enough and whether it's going to work out or not. Obviously, I've been doing this long enough now that it's penciled or I wouldn't be right. continuing to do it. So, yeah. I love it. That's the I first thing it. that comes to mind. So, so for those that are out there wondering, they're on the fence of, should I take this, this investment or should I take that one or should I bootstrap? What are some things that you've used to kind of create that decision-making process in your own mind? 
And are you ever planning to raise anything? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And just because I've never raised capital doesn't mean I won't in the future. So right. I'll definitely put that out there. I think it's a really important decision. It's 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 the most important decision that you're going to make in the beginning of your business. Right. And the reason is, and it's also actually, I believe, a very individual decision. Yeah. So if you you may be somebody that's out of college and just don't have any cash. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have ca cash is the is the oxygen of your business. And if yes. you don't have cash, you're not going to get it off the ground. Right. Um, if you're somebody that's a little bit more fortunate and you've had the opportunity to do some exits and you can invest some capital, the decision might be a little bit different. You know, then it comes down to to two things, fear and risk. Fair enough. You know, are you are you willing to actually take the risk? How much do you believe yeah. in your own business model to take that risk? And then the fear, no good decision has ever been made out of fear. So obviously it's kind of a white knuckled ride no matter yes. what. So like when you're starting your business, you don't know what the heck's going to happen. Right. You could have an incredible two year run and then tank because right. you have an elephant problem and 70% of your business is coming from one customer, you know, or whatever the economy could go south. But I like that. Elephant uh, problem. Those are sort of the two prime decision points. But it's definitely an individual decision about raising outside capital or not. Love it. But it definitely is individual. And 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 for those of you that have, don't feel like it's the wrong thing to do because in many cases it is the right thing to do. And Jeff, you and I have both been fortunate enough to have had enough success that we can fund some of our fraud our projects moving forward, which I'm grateful for, and it sounds like you're very grateful for as well. No question about it. Awesome. So, so as you look forward to the growth and, and continued journey, um, I talk to a lot of people about their exits and that's not normally part of the interview, but as you look, you know, a lot of immature companies or younger companies, all they think about is launch, 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 and they don't really think about an exit. You've had exits, you've had acquisitions, you've been part of both sides of the equation how do you guide or coach people through this experience of, okay, now that I've launched, what am I going to do? And then to what end? Do you have some advice there? I'd love to pick your brain on that. Yeah. I think the number one thing that I think about is as a business owner, how can you maximize your options for exit, whether you want to exit or not? I like that. And what I mean by that is, what ways are you reducing dependency on yourself in the business? I have seen way too many business owners get so emotionally wrapped up in their business that yeah. they like that dependency. So that they, yeah. they feel important and they feel like they're that's a part of it. And that's okay for some people. Right. But the more uh, processes and systems you can put in place, the better people that you can hire and the the higher the degree of competency on your team, and especially from an interpersonal standpoint, yeah, yeah, how they get along and the trust levels in your organization, the more you can reduce the dependency on yourself. And then quite frankly, you're gonna massively increase your valuation because right. when somebody goes to buy you, what do they wanna buy? They wanna buy a company that is fully self-sustaining and not right. dependent on its it's owner, owner founder. it's founder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. And and I love how you you kind of reiterated what I teach a lot of, which is people, processes, and tools. You know, yeah. you just can't think about an exit until you have that under control because owner-dependent businesses, you sell and you get the golden handcuffs and you're never going to get out of it, you know? Exactly. If it's a process-driven business, you can look at the future with bright eyes and say, okay, increase revenue sell the business and I'm a free man, right? Exactly, exactly. The other thing too, I was thinking about Todd is that if you know you're gonna sell your business in three years or five years, there are things that you really need to be thinking about today Love it. in order to get there. All the, it's so common for business owners to just be reactionary. All of a sudden 
they hit a wall and they think, I want out. I, I yeah. want to exit. And then they don't have things in place in order to make that happen really smoothly. You know, and, and sometimes all it takes is a couple more deals that may not be the perfect deals for you, but they're perfect for the one that might want to buy you. That increased exactly. your valuation that you never exactly. would have thought about, you know? Exactly. I love it. I love it. Well, Jeff, this has been an awesome conversation. I I, I love the input. I love the experience. Tell me last of all, though, being a founder or being someone who runs an organization is a very lonely role. How have you found, is there somebody in your circle that you've found to be kind of that inspiring motivator who kind of keeps you moving on? Yeah, there's a number of people. I have been a part of a CEO group myself, a, right. a separate group from one that I run for a number of years. And it's a smaller group and it's got some some people that have tremendous wisdom in there. So that's been one source for me. Love it. I also have an incredibly close friend and mentor that I, I meet with weekly. Awesome. Uh, and so that's been very helpful. And of course, my wife, you know, I, I bounce things off of her all the time. And love it. It's always it. Those people are the lifeline. They really have helped me and inspired me to keep going, even when it's I love tough. It. I love it. If you're a founder out there who doesn't have someone in your circle to get your back, you need to. You need to join a CEO group. You need to join, a, you know, find a mentor. So many people are willing to do it. I have mentored dozens of people in my local community who just call me up and say, can I take you to lunch and ask you some questions? I love that. And I think that people like Jeff totally willing to do the same thing. And if you're not in touch with someone like that, you've got to do it. It'll help you in so many ways. So Jeff, thank you so much for the inspiring words. Anything you want to mention in closing? Is there someplace you're at on social media people can follow you? I'm more active on LinkedIn than anywhere else. And awesome. um, uh, you can find me, Jeff Hunt, at LinkedIn. You can also find us at goalspan.com. And the podcast is goalspan.com forward slash human capital. I love it. I can't wait to hear it. Thanks so much for being on today, Jeff. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me, Todd. Great conversation. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Loved the interview. Loved the guy. We ended up talking for quite a while after our interview about some of the things that he's done to enhance his peer network, enhance his ability to grow and scale through strategic networking between his network, which is awesome. These are all things I probably should have put in the podcast, but it was a fun conversation to have. If you haven't done so already, listen to some other interviews as well. This podcast is designed for people like you trying to grow and scale their businesses and if you don't have the right peer network or the right organization or community to be a part of, join now. We are having people sign up for our community to get access to not only the interviews, but the interviewees. We are bringing our panels of people that we've interviewed on the podcast into our community so that you can get access to them, ask them questions, and be part of their growth journeys, as well as making them part of your growth journeys. Growing and scaling a business is not something you need to do on your own. There is a community. There are people here to help. And we are so glad that you're here listening to this podcast, enjoying the, the intellectual property being shared by each one of these founders and driving yourself to that next stage of growth in your business. Thank you for being here. Like, share, subscribe, send this episode to someone who needs to hear it. And we look forward to catching you on the next episode.